December 17th, 2013 marked the release of the R7 260. Like its previously released bigger brother, the HD 7790, the R7 260 was built on the same GCN 2.0 architecture. As a result, the R7 260, like all GCN 2.0 cards, supports the DirectX 12.0 set of features. Like the HD 7000 series, the R7 260 enjoys Vulkan support and game-ready drivers were released for it up until mid-2021, when it, like all its GCN 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0 relatives, was put on legacy driver support. We'd also like to point out another feature of this card, namely its hardware support for video encoding. You heard that right. Unlike one of the newer and more expensive video cards, this particular old GPU allows hardware video encoding. And for as long as the aforementioned newer video card stays above 100 USD, we'll make a point to remind our viewers that older, cheaper video cards have this capability. While the former 7790, soon to be named R7 260X, used the fully unlocked Bonaire chip, the R7 260 uses a cut-down version of it with only 768 shading cores, 48 texture mapping units and 16 ROPs. The GPU, running at 1000 MHz, uses a 128-bit bus to communicate with its 1500 MHz clocked 1GB DDR5 memory. The expected power consumption for this card is 95 watts, so the card has only one 6-pin power connector. For the cooling solution, Asus went to use an extruded aluminium heatsink, on which it then placed two 75mm fans. The card kept its cool in both heaven, where it reached a 37 Celsius over ambient, and in warframe where the delta over ambient stayed at 43 degrees. Results for Apex Legends are promising. With an average of 57 FPS and 1% lows of 35, the game is somewhat acceptable at 1080p low settings. Lowering the resolution to 720p increases the values to 74 FPS average and 50 FPS 1% lows. Fans of FSR apps like Magpie and Lossless Scaling will rejoice at these numbers, since it will allow them to upscale a 720p rendered image to 1080p using the quality settings in FSR. With an arm at best. In Call of Duty Warzone, the numbers at 720p low settings are a bit lower, almost 60 FPS average and 42 FPS 1% lows. Again. Your preferred FSR tool will allow similar performance on 1080p with quality FSR preset. And while not as sharp as native 1080p, it is better than the simple upscaling used by your monitor. Let's go. In a similar vein as with the HD7770, the multiplayer training map in Battlefield 5 performs a bit better at similar 720p low settings with an average FPS of almost 65 and 1% lows of 41. This makes the R7 260 less of an issue in multiplayer and it allows the option of an FPS cap of 60 to improve the 1% lows a bit. Control plays quite smooth at 720p low settings, reaching averages of 57 FPS and 1% lows of 33. Quite frequently, the FPS will reach 60, and since the card has a few extra shaders and quite a bit more memory bandwidth, one can tinker with the settings to improve the look of the game. Also, don't forget about the FSR apps out there. Rainbow Six Siege runs well on the R7 260, and while the numbers at 1080p low settings 100% render scale do not look that impressive, with an average of 61 FPS and 1% lows of 49, things improve when downscaling the rendering resolution. At the same 1080p but 50% render scale, the average shoots up to 88 FPS 
and the 1% lows to 67. 720p 100% render scale has the numbers at almost 120 fps average and almost 86 fps 1% lows. From using the internal render scaling to an external FSR tool, there are options here if you want to keep even the 1% lows above 60 fps. Alien Isolation ran fine on less powerful cards, so, to no surprise, it runs very well also on the R7 260. At 1080p ultra settings, the game reaches an average of 54 fps, occasionally going up to 62. At 1080p low settings, CSGO reached an average fps of 160 in DA dust. The 1% lows of 91 will put no problem for the more competitive player. Like with almost all multiplayer games from our set of tests, it will be the skill, not the hardware, that will decide who wins the match. And if the average FPS is too high for one's taste, you have the option to increase the graphical settings. Dota 2 runs well on 1080p low settings, with an average of 111 FPS and 1% lows at 55. Like with the other games that run well over 60 FPS, you now have the possibility to increase the graphical options while maintaining a good FPS. And the cherry on top, you can use FSR without a third party app. Fortnite reached an average of 105 FPS with 1% lows of 31. And despite the last number, the game experience is good at 1080p, performance mode and far view distance. With the R7 260, you may use a view distance of Epic to get some competitive advantage and to cure the LOD bugs that affect some of the vegetation. Rocket League is a pretty forgiving game, so the average of 115 FPS and the 1% lows of 41 come as no surprise. Like with other games, the R7 260 will allow you better settings than the 1080p low settings used here. Splitgate will reach 83 FPS on average at 1080p low settings with a 1% low value of 38. And while 1080p is already playable, Lowering the resolution to 720p will increase the numbers to almost 120 FPS on average with 1% lows at 56. If a high refresh rate is mandatory, but the 720p image looks too ugly, then FSR apps or the render resolution scaler are both viable options. Valorant is an easy to run game at 1080p low settings. Averages of 217 FPS and 1% lows of 132 FPS will rightfully make you wonder if you should raise the settings. And like with the previous game, the R7 260 will allow you to increase the video options and still provide a high refresh rate. Genshin Impact will average at 60 FPS at 1080p low settings and render scale set to 1. The 1% lows of almost 43 FPS will provide a smooth gaming experience. An average of 126 FPS and 1% lows of almost 68, Paladins is a smooth experience at 1080p with a mix of settings. There is enough room here to increase the game settings to the maximum and still perform well. We reach a similar conclusion with another title from the same developer. Realm Royale, at 1080p and a mix of settings, mostly set to high, reaches average of almost 111 and 1% lows of almost 52. The 0.1% lows at 9.4 FPS may cause an occasional stutter. Still in the realm of free shooters, we have another game, Rogue Company. 
With an average of 95 FPS, the game plays well at 1080p low settings. The 1% lows of almost 24 FPS may have more to do with the camera switching when getting wiped out than with the in-game stutter. World of Tanks Blitz has a cap of 60 FPS due to the monitor being used. The average FPS is basically 60 and the 1% lows is 52, so the game plays smoothly. And these numbers are quite good for this lower paced multiplayer game. For Warframe we use the Mariana mission, which is the same one used for the review of the HD7770. The average reached here at 1080p and lower settings is 95 FPS and the 1% lows is 54 FPS. This is more than adequate for this PvE title. Used GPUs will always be good as a stopgap solution until you get the money for the GPU that you really want, but that is as long as the market is fairly stable. And once the GPU of your dreams comes knocking at your door, you now have the option to resell the old GPU to recover most if not all of your initial investment, again, as long as the market is stable enough. APUs are touted as a better solution than using an old GPU, however, the iGPU does not come for free. You either pay for it in performance of the CPU, or in plain money, as is in the case of Intel. In case of AMD, the iGPUs in their G series of Ryzen APUs are quite good. But without a non-G, non-X equivalent CPU, it is more difficult to assess the cost of their iGPU in either price or performance. In the case of Intel, however, the difference is exactly 25 USD for their Core i5 line of CPUs. And up until Alder Lake, for 25 USD, the odds of buying an old discrete GPU that beats the i5 iGPU are quite good. Do I need to mention that you can even increase that budget if you plan to resell the old GPU? When the card was released about 8 years ago, it was quite difficult to recommend it. While the MSRP was placed close to the HD 7770, the street price was closer to the HD 7790. However, the performance delta did not match the price, and the usual recommendation back then was to save a few more bucks and buy the card with the full Bonaire chip. To add to this, the availability of the R7260 was not that great. My speculation is that it used chips that could not be used in the 7790, which makes it a byproduct of the bigger brother card. The card is to be kept an eye on in 2022 though. It can go as low as 30 USD and still allow playing more recent titles. In my case, the R7260 was an impulse buy. The ad that I spotted placed it at what I'd normally expect an HD7770 to go. So I decided to basically add one more GPU to what was then my two cards GPU collection. I was glad to buy it though. While the shader count is higher than the HD7770, the number of ROPs is the same, allowing for some interesting comparisons. 